early even. Thanks again for answering our questions. So the last presentation in today's session is entitled Edge Tags per Half Edge Texturing for Arbitrary Mesh Topologies. And it's work by Villain Barbier and Jonathan Dupuis, both from Unity. And it's a, a better p text for as much as I understand. And I'm curious to hear the presentation. Hi. I am William Barbier, and today I'm going to present HTEC, our novel GPU-friendly texturing algorithm for arbitrary meshes that is based on half edges. Before I describe our method, I would like to start with some motivation for this work. Nowadays, painting software such as Substance Painter or Mudbox are widespread. Their key feature is to allow artists to intuitively texture their assets by directly painting on the mesh surface. The main motivation behind EdgeTech is to provide the ability to drag and drop any mesh in such software so that you can immediately start painting without any additional steps. The key to make this work is the texturing method, which will allow us to map text cells onto the mesh surface. And of course, in order to guarantee interactive frame rates, we also want this method to map entirely on the GPU. With this in mind, the first candidate we can look at is UV mapping. UV mapping works by unfolding the mesh onto a quad that is then associated with a texture, as shown in the middle here. This method is ubiquitous as it is supported everywhere. However, it does have a few drawbacks. First, the UV map is usually created manually by artists, which is a tedious process. And actually, at Unity, UV unwrapping is what our artists hate the most, and this is probably a very widespread feeling. Another issue is that UV mapping is discontinuous by nature. This means that it systematically results in quacks with displacement maps, as shown on the right here. Our second texturing candidate is PTEC, which is Disney's standard texturing method. Let's zoom into the blue area to see how it works. The idea is simple. Rather than using a single texture for the entire mesh, use one texture for each face of the mesh. This results in the following parameterization. The key feature of PTEC is that it is fully automatic. Since it directly builds upon the faces of the mesh, it frees artists from any kind of UV authoring while also guaranteeing continuous texturing results over the entire mesh, as opposed to UV mapping. Despite these advantages, PTEC turns out to be problematic for certain types of meshes. To illustrate this problem, let's have a look at another part of the mesh. In this area, the mesh is mostly composed of quads, but it also carries a triangle, shown in green. Now, if you have one texture per face, it's not clear how to handle such topology. The key problem here is that we want to apply square textures on non-quad topologies, and this is very difficult to do. In practice, PTEC splits non-quad faces in quad subfaces. Unfortunately, this introduces complexity in the filtering code, which translates into branching on the GPU that hurts performance. Due to this issue, GPU implementations of PTEC are usually restricted to quad-only meshes. In this work, we introduce a novel quadrangulation that allows to map square textures on the surface of any topological configuration. And here is the quadrangulation we derive, thanks to our contributions, which lie at the foundation of HTEC. The resulting parameterization may look a bit complex at first sight. However, it is actually very simple to build and requires no additional data other than that of a half-edge mesh. And actually, it is so simple that I can already summarize our entire approach in a few slides that I hope you can take away from this talk. And here we go. We start from the input mesh shown here. And the primitives that HTEC builds upon are the half-edges, which are usually drawn as digital arrows shown here. For those of you who are not familiar with half edges, I will provide more detail about them later. But here I want to provide our key insight, which is that half edges actually encode a triangulation of the mesh, where each half edge maps to one triangle as follows. The other key property is that this particular triangulation leads to a quadrangulation that is well suited to the problem of texturing. We obtain this quadrangulation by merging pairs of triangles that share a common edge of the original mesh, like so. The resulting quadrangulation 
is what we use as our base primitive for texturing, as shown in the orange inset here. Thanks to HTech, we now have a GPU-friendly solution that provides the best of both worlds between UV maps and PTech. In the remainder of this talk, I will describe in more detail how we build HTech, which we can summarize as the following four main blocks: the input mesh, the half edges, the triangulation, and the quadrangulation. Let's start by providing more details on the half-edge data structure. Half-edges are a data structure that encodes the connectivity of a mesh. The half-edges are this arrow that you see here, and on the right we have the operators that are applied to the half-edges to query adjacency information of the mesh. And now I will go through these operators one by one. First we have the twin operator, which gives us the opposite half-edge. The next operator gives us the next half-edge in the face. The prev operator gives us the previous half edge in the face. The verge operator gives us the vertex that carries the half edge. The edge operator gives us the edge spanned by the half edge. And the face operator gives us the face that contains the half edge. All of these operators allow us to query adjacency information of the mesh, and they are going to be useful for filtering. To use this data structure in practice, we need a GPU implementation. To represent a mesh, such as the one shown on the left, we use two buffers. First, a vertex buffer that stores the positions of the vertices. And second, a half-edge buffer that stores the half-edge data structure. Here, you see that each row corresponds to one operator, and each column corresponds to one half-edge. If you look at the half-edge 7 highlighted in blue here, we see that its twin half-edge is a half-edge 1, and we can find this information here in our half-edge buffer. Another example, if we want to find the next half-edge of the half-edge 7, which is half-edge 8, we just have to look it up in our half-edge buffer here. As you can see, all the half-edge operators are implemented simply as a lookup in an array. Now that you have the half-edges, we are going to see how they encode the triangulation of the mesh. On the left here is our input mesh, and on the right is the corresponding triangulation. And I'm going to show you this is how this triangulation is defined, by taking the example of the blue half edge here. The first vertex of the corresponding triangle is shown in red here, and is just the vertex of the half edge. The second vertex, shown in green here, is the vertex of the next half edge. And the third vertex, shown in orange, is the very center of the face that contains the half edge. We obtain the blue triangle here, and if we do the same thing with all the half edges, we get the following triangulation where each half edge maps to one triangle. This triangulation has a very nice property that I'm going to illustrate by applying the half edge operators to the blue half edge. So first we have the twin half edge shown in red, the previous half edge shown in orange, and the next half edge shown in green. And we see that the neighbors of any triangle can be queried using the half edge operators. This is a very useful property that we will use in our filtering algorithm. To sum up, we have shown that the half edges encode the triangulation of the input mesh. This means that we don't need to store this triangulation, since it is given by the half edges. Additionally, we can find the neighbors of any triangle of this triangulation using the half edge operators. Now, I am going to show you how we build a quadrangulation from this triangulation. Our starting point is the triangulation that I just described. To build our quadrangulation, we merge triangles that correspond to twin half edges. Or another way to see it is that we merge triangles that share an edge of the input mesh. This gives us this quadrangulation, where each edge of the input mesh maps to one quad of our quadrangulation. And once again, this is directly encoded by the half edges, so we don't need to store it. A useful property of this construction is that since half edges map to triangles, and edges mapped to quads, we can know which quad contains any triangle by applying the edge operator. Now that we have our quadrangulation, we can simply do the same thing as PTEC and store one texture for each quad. Like this. This way, we are able to texture our model, which has triangles, quad and endgons, without defining texture coordinates. And now I'm going to show you how we handle meshes with boundaries. The triangulation step is exactly the same, it doesn't change here. For the quadrangulation step, we are still going to merge together triangles that share an edge of the input mesh, which gives us this result here. 
you see here that interior edges of the input mesh map to quads and boundary edges map to triangles. And we texture our model by associating one texture with each of these quads or triangles. And to avoid filtering artifacts, we mirror the textures for the boundary edges. This means that we waste 50% of the memory for these boundary edges, but they are a small minority, so in practice it is negligible. And now that we've seen how edge tech textures are defined, I'm going to explain how to use them inside the rendering pipeline. And I'm going to compare edge tech with borderless PTEC, which is a state of the art GPU implementation of PTEC. Borderless PTEC works only with quad meshes, and it works by drawing the faces of the mesh. The information that it needs to do a texture lookup is the index of the face and the position inside the face. To have seamless filtering, it also takes as input the list of adjacent faces. As a result, we get a textured quad. With HTEC, we draw the triangles that are given by the triangulation that I described. To do a texture lookup, we need the index of the current half edge, which is also the index of the triangle, and the barycentric coordinates inside the triangle. To have seamless filtering, we use the half edge data structure for adjacency queries, and our output is a textured triangle. And now, I'm going to show you our filtering algorithm. As you will see, it is very simple and fits on this slide. Here, we are drawing the blue triangle, and we want to integrate the texture under this footprint. We first query the neighbors of the blue triangle using the half edge operators next and prev. Then, we do a first texture fetch for the quad that contains the blue triangle. The hardware filtering unit integrates the part of the footprint that lies inside of this quad. Then, we do another texture fetch for the quad that contains our first neighbor. Here, it returns zero because the quad doesn't intersect the footprint. And we do a last texture fetch for the quad that contains the other neighbor. And that's it. With just three texture fetches, we get seamless filtering. And as you can see, the code is very simple and consists of the half edge operators, of texture fetches, and of this small function triangle to quad UV that transform the point from the coordinates of the triangle to the quad, and is also only a few lines. And all of it fits on the slide. And now, I'm going to compare our algorithm with the algorithm used by borderless PTEC, which is quite similar. Here, the setup is identical. We are drawing the quad in blue, and we want to integrate the texture inside the red footprint. To do this, we are first going to fetch the texture of the center quad, and then fetch the textures of each of the neighbors. Borderless PTEC requires in total 5 texture fetches, while EdgeTech only needs 3. And now, I'm going to show some results. The main achievement of our algorithm is that it works natively with meshes of arbitrary topologies. For example, this mesh here has both triangle and quads. Our algorithm is also compatible with hardware and isotropic filtering, as you can see here. HTEC also enables crack-free displacement. Here is a demo of a production asset rendered with displacement mapping and adaptive tessellation using HTEC. And here, we render another asset with displacement mapping using both edge tech and traditional, U traditional UV mapping. As you can see, UV mapping introduces cracks in the displaced surface, while edge tech remains crack free. Now, let's talk about performance. We did a first comparison between edge tech and borderless P tech with both a single albedo texture and with an additional displacement texture. In both cases, we find that EdgeTech is faster. We also compared EdgeTech with UV mapping. We find that EdgeTech is slower because of the additional memory accesses and texture fetches, but it remains in the same ballpark and achieves real-time performance by far. To conclude, we presented our novel texturing algorithm that is based on a half edge data structure and works natively with meshes of arbitrary topologies. If you are interested, you can find the code at this address shown here. And I would like to end this talk with an open-ended question. 
you might have noticed that our filtering algorithm only uses the properties of our triangulation. The quadrangulation is actually only needed because the hardware texture unit works with square textures. If we had some kind of triangular texture unit, we could simply store one texture per triangle of our triangulation, which would both simplify the algorithm and remove the memory waste at the boundary. We think that this is a neat idea, and we would be interested in hearing about other original use cases for a triangular texture unit. So that's all for me, thank you for listening, and I will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you for the presentation. And we have plenty of time for questions. There's one already on the board. Is our speaker here? Oh, both of them. Hello. Yes. So, the... so, so I, do I read the question or you are already read it? Uh, I can. Okay, so the question was, what kind of artifacts might result from, with triangles that contain long and skinny triangles, and right. how, how do you deal with them? And so uh, the artifacts that you might get are uh, anisotropic texels, which lead to distortion. Uh, so this is an issue. This can be an issue, but it's an issue with all uh, of the methods that are similar, like uh, PTEC or mesh colors, that uh, that are dependent on the topology uh, of the mesh. So if you have uh, a mesh with uh, low quality that has uh, elongated uh, faces or skinny triangles, you might get uh, distortion issues. Uh, like this. Maybe let me ask a follow up here. What happens if you encounter that during animation? Can you always avoid this? You would need to like rebake all the textures to avoid all the the squashed mm -hmm. parametrization. Mm, the parametrization, uh, oh. Um, well, we hmm, we don't uh, we don't change the par parameterization with the with the animation uh, unless the topology changes with the animation. Uh, but uh, since our uh, our parameterization is built upon the topology, if you have just a skin mesh where the topology do doesn't change, then our parameterization stays fixed. So if you have triangle that are uh, that uh, become skinny with the animation, that uh, stretch or squash, you might see. Uh, some uh, some artifacts uh, close by this. Right, thanks. There's one more question. How do you pack the quad textures? Is there a border? And if so, how does that interact with anisotropic filtering? So we don't pack the quad textures. Uh, we use bindless textures. So for each quad, we, we have a one texture. And uh, bindless textures allow, this, allow us to uh, fetch basically any of those uh, at runtime. Uh, so we don't need to pack them, which means that uh, we get an, an isotropic filtering uh, for free. We don't, we don't uh, have any kind of SIM artifacts with an isotropic filtering that can result when you pack your, all your textures uh, in, a, in a single class. Uh, and I think another part was, uh, uh, well, th so we don't need any borders uh, either. We don't pack the textures. Right. So, I, so actually, we, use, uh, we actually use the hardware uh, 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 texture you need to compute the border that gives us uh, a weight for each texture tap and we then blend the three uh, texture taps all together using this blending weight similar to what is done in uh, borderless p -tech. that makes sense thank you there's one more question if you have multiple lod's for a mesh is it possible to reuse the same texture storage I don't, not in the general case at least, maybe maybe in some special cases, but uh, I don't think uh, we haven't investigated it, but uh, not simply at least. Seems like uh, a hard one. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really, you really need to see HTEC like a, a PTEC uh, alternative. So you're really tied to the topology of the mesh. So if whenever you change the topology, you have diff a different set of textures. So obviously, if you use uh, discrete LODs, you have different topologies, so you have a different set of textures. OK, right. That makes sense. So you'll just have multiple meshes along with multiple textures, right? Yes. So one, one thing maybe that uh, could be useful is that in general, if, if you apply the same uh, PTEC pipeline, what usually happens is that artists paint on uh, a control cage that is used as input for subdivision surfaces. So it usually is a, U poly, uh, a low poly mesh, 
and you can you can actually compute the discrete LODs from this uh, low poly mesh to the more refined version of the sub D right. using the actual same set of textures. One thing you can't do is decimate the mesh and reuse the textures. That would be more complex. I see. So you're saying at least the authoring step would be done once yes. and then you'd reuse that. Yeah. I see. Andrew, is that the mic if you want to ask your um, question? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. yes. I just wanted to follow up on that last point that you said, Jonathan. Uh, if you were to author on a sort of a control cage or a, a decimated version of the mesh from which all the other LODs are derived, would then your method have to be modified to support like groups of triangles rather than single triangles or the or the quadrangulation is somewhat independently computed? No, this uh, you, you can really, uh, HTEC supports any topology. So uh, you can just give it any, anything you want as input, but like you, as you asked in the, as you were doing your first question, if you have really a, a poor quality mesh, then the texels will be highly anisotropic and you'll have poor texel distribution on the surface uh, of the mesh. Okay, thank you, great work. Thanks. Still plenty of time. There's one more, this is more of a comment on the question yeah. board. We're loading the link right now. <laughs> Texture mapping progressive meshes. I, have you read this paper? No. <laughs> I mean, I mean, okay. <laughs> but uh, we'll investigate. Discuss. Thank you. Uh, yes. Thank you, uh, Vasco. Thank you very much for the link. I have one more quick question, maybe. Can you comment on the storage overhead for the mesh itself? It seems like you're storing, what, like six index buffers for each half edge. Is that more than a regular vertex index triangular mesh? Yeah, that's it. It's exactly what you said. Like okay. you can you can really see it as a index, a vertex buffer, the same vertex buffer and an index buffer, but instead of having a single integer per index, you have six. Okay, and you store these full thirty-two bits, and is there a yes a way? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. I think I have no further question. Are there any more from the audience, maybe? That does not seem to be the case. So thank you too again for answering our questions. Very nice presentation. Thank you.